Okay, um, so hello everyone. Welcome to the um, second webinar in this um, series that we have uh, put together um, for the Zapatista Journey Through Life uh, in UK and Europe. Today's title of the webinar is Resisting Mega Projects, Current Struggles Against Neoliberal Extraction. So particularly uh, for today, the webinar, and first of all, I'm sorry, I should have introduced myself. <laughs> My name is Jimena, I'm part of the Zapatista Solidarity Network. Uh, we've been putting together, like I said, this series of webinars to have conversations about struggles, about different ways of living, about understanding the world in different ways and trying to envision different ways in which we can um, live together as the Zapatistas have inspired us to do. Uh, we are very grateful to have you all here, very grateful for all of your very generous donations in our crowdfunder, which will be shared throughout this seminar into the chat in case anyone else wants to make further donations. It has um, some really great rewards uh, in exchange of your donations. Uh, most of the rewards come in directly from Chiapas, from Zapatistas themselves, or from uh, other indigenous groups. Um, so be sure to check that out. And again, I cannot stress this enough how very thankful we are for all of your donations. Um, so coming back to the topic of today's seminar, as I said, it's about resisting mega projects. And particularly, we will be discussing the current struggles against environmentally disastrous mega projects. Uh, our aim of uh, discussion today is to make important connections in the environmental struggles, not only in Mexico, but also within UK and beyond, demonstrating ultimately how these struggles are pieces of a larger global movement to protect environment from neoliberal extraction. We have some great presentations lined up, which we are sure will make for a great conversation. We have joining us uh, today, uh, Leandro Vergara Camus. We have Emilio and Paloma from Tejiendo Organización uh, Revolucionaria. We have Alejandro de Coscorso and Laura Dowley. Um, and we will have the way that we will go about it is we will have 20 minute presentations from each of the presenters, all of them back to back. Uh, this is the part of the session that will be recorded. After that, we will stop the recording and we will have about half an hour for Q&A, um, chat and, and this sort. Um, I will ask uh, for presenters to try to keep to their time just to make sure that we have as much time possible for the Q&A. Um, the presentations will be both um, in English and Spanish. So if any of you uh, need interpretation or translation to a particular language, just go uh, to the down bar and you will find like a little kind of like world emoji that says interpretation. And there you just pick the channel that you wish um, to hear. So without further ado, I will present the first of our speakers. Uh, Leandro Barakamu is a professor and head of the Studies and Research Hub in Social Economics and Innovation at the, I'm sorry for material pronunciation in French, Université de l'Ontario Français in Toronto, Canada. He has conducted research on the Latin American left, the Zapatistas movement in Chiapas, and the landless rural workers movement in Brazil, peasant agriculture, and the history of land struggles over property rights in Latin America. His fields of expertise include theories of development, political economy of development, and historical sociology state of state and class formation. His current research is in the internationalization of the Brazilian sugarcane ethanol industry. So without further ado, I give the floor to Leandro. Thank you very much, Jimena. Can you hear me? Yes? yes. Okay. Well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm really, really excited about the visit of the Zapatista, like all of you. I first want to thank the organizers for inviting me and for organizing this event. Um, I'm really, really excited that the Compas are, are soon going to land on European soil and will be sharing their experience with us and establishing new bridges. Um, I actually, I've dreamed about this moment for many years. Uh, and I always I wondered how it would be. And um, I have to say, and probably you will agree with me, that I'd never, never thought 
that it was going to be this way that they were going to come to Europe. Because tracing the steps of the European colonizer back to Europe by boat, signaling the reversal of the colonial tide is really, really brilliant. It's, it's, I think it's, it's the way the Zapatista always amaze us with uh, their politics and with their, their, their symbols. Uh, so I'm very excited, but at the same time, I'm also sad because um, I've dreamt about this for so many years, but uh, I will not be in the UK when our uh, comrades Zapatista are going to be here because I'm leaving for Canada by, in, in mid-July and probably won't be able, able to witness this historical event in person. Um, but I, I know that most of you will so I, I wish you well, and I wish you. I, I wish uh, I. I really uh, appreciate the work that the colleagues are doing, uh, the solidarity, the Mexico solidarity in London and other parts of Europe in in helping this this along. Um, I was a student at UNAM in 1997, the first time that the Zapatista broke the military siege and came to Mexico City. So at least I can I can have that moment to con as consolation. I was also I had the privilege later to live in a Zapatista community for several months, uh, and it's partially from this uh, and through this uh, experience and what I learned in those months that I want to speak today, um, and I want to do it especially by highlighting the the peasant and the indigenous character of the Zapatista movement. Of course, the topic of this session is mega project, but uh, I've asked the, the uh, organizers to focus my intervention on the privatization of the right to land, which can easily be seen uh, as a mega project of its own. Because in, in a certain sense, when pr the privatization of the right to land is carried out, it completely transforms the relationship that organize a community, a region, and the landscape of that territory, just like mega projects do. So we have to think about privatization of, of land and the privatization of the right to land, more specifically, as the mother of all mega projects. Because although uh, it's not as concrete as a mine, as a superhighway, as an airport, as a solar park or a wind farm or a tourist complex. All these mega projects actually require very often or are preceded by the direct attacks on the right to land uh, of peasant and working class communities. So the struggle for uh, against the privatization of the right to land also speaks directly to the Zapatista struggle. But not only that, it speaks to the very long history of struggles of peasant communities throughout Mexico. Uh, these struggles actually date back at least to the 19th century at the moment of independence of Mexico. But it reaches its high point uh, with the Mexican revolution of, the of 1910-1917. Uh, it appears distant, but it's very important to remember that revolution because that revolution was a peasant uh, revolution against the privatization of the right to land that uh, the ruling elite at the time, the landed elites, were carrying out since independence, not only in Mexico, but throughout Latin America. The moment of independence was actually one of the most important moments of dispossession of indigenous and peasant communities uh, of the history of Latin America. Um, and the successful rebellion of millions of peasants in Mexico obliged the subsequent regime to carry out an agrarian reform, so to distribute land to the poor and to protect their access to land. And the regime was only obliged to do that because peasants, indigenous, rebelled against the process of privatization. Out of this uh, first, if you want, uh, Mexican revolution, uh, Mexico created a land property figure called the Ejido. 
The Hido land is land that is held collectively by a community. And then the land is distributed to the families of that community based on needs. The decision in an ejido are taken collectively through the ejido assembly. Until 1992, the ejido land could not be sold, could not be leased or put up for collateral for loans, meaning that land, uh, peasant land was actually protected by the Mexican constitution. As you know, the ZLN began organizing and radicalizing peasant and indigenous communities whose right to land and their ejidos were being threatened by the creation of an ecological reserve in the Lac and Dona Jongo uh, in the 1980s. Uh, these ejido communities had, create, had been created since the 1960s and onwards to provide indigenous people from other regions of Chiapas with access to land because they couldn't have access to land anymore in their communities because of demographic pressure uh, in the, basically in the highlands of, of, of Chiapas and in other regions uh, around Chiapas uh, too. Um, but it, it is really the formal privatization of Ejido land through the constitutional reform of President uh, Carlos Salinas that accelerated the radicalization of these peasant communities. So the Zapatista struggle is fundamentally a defense of the right to land based on needs, not on money. Land is at the core of the Zapatista search for autonomy. It is at the core because land allows a peasant fam family to live in dignity, to grow food, to have a roof over their heads, and in, basically to keep control over their lives. And peasant families in Chiapas, peasant families making up the, the, the Zapatista uh, guerrilla movement, revalue their access to land because they contrast this, this access to land and what it provides them with the harsh difficulty of living from uh, the low wages in neighboring plantation farms or in the, in the cities uh, in Chiapas and in, throughout Mexico. It is very different to be able to rely on land for your subsistence than to have to sell your labor power in all kinds of activities and might constantly having to migrate out of your community. Access to land also allows a community to control its territory and to establish over this territory the rules of the use and the distribution of land. And, al and along with this, to establish the principles that are going to organize the local economy. And that's what the Zapatista have done throughout these years. They have established a different, another type of economy based on subsistence, on solidarity, on redistribution, on barter very often, on labor exchange, on all kinds of forms of production that are non-capitalist in essence. The access to, to land also allows several communities to take control of a larger territory. And you all know about the autonomous communities, uh, the, the, the autonomous municipalities, uh, the juntas de buen gobierno, et cetera, et cetera. All the uh, political infrastructure of uh, popular power that the Zapatista have put in place. And this has allowed the Zapatista to actually govern themselves under their own rules and under uh, their own ideology, their own ideas. And if you speak to any Zapatista, it's probably the thing that they're most, the prouder of this ability to govern themselves, the giving themselves their own rules. So, and, on, and, and related to the topic of today, this territorial control, this larger territorial control organized around uh, popular sovereignty also allows these community to control the type of development that they want in their territory and thus to oppose mega projects. Uh, the Zapatista, it is one of the incredible 
uh, achievement have been able to uh, oppose mega projects on their territory. And this, if, if, we, if we remember, is what the Zapatista were trying to formalize through the San Andres Accord that they had negotiated with the Mexican government in the mid 19, uh, 1990s. And this is also the reason why the state refused to keep its promise uh, to the Zapatista. Uh, we can speak of the San Andreas Accord if you want a little bit later, but probably everyone here knows what they were about. Okay, so the Zapatista's struggle is a defense of the right to, to land, but it's also a democratization of that right. And it's a democratization of the right to land in two ways. First, uh, it is the democratization of access to land, and it's uh, a kind of a recent wave of agrarian reform in Mexico. It's the latest wave of agrarian reform in Mexico, actually, because the, 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 the agrarian reform had stopped in Mexico already in the 1980s, but peasants in many regions of Mexico still were demanding land, needed land for their subsistence, and the Zapatista rebellion brought back the, this issue and actually tens of thousands of Chapans, indigenous peasant families gained access to land uh, through uh, the Zapatista rebellion and, or protected their access to land thanks to the Zapatistas uh, in many regions of, of, of Chiapas. It's also a democratization of the right to land internally because Ejido, just as I mentioned earlier, exist have existed ever since the Mexican Revolution. They were put in place uh, after the Mexican Revolution and in the, after the 1930s en masse in many regions of Mexico. But in many, many regions of Mexico, including Chiapas, uh, these ejidos were not necessarily democratic. And they were not democratic because many of these, the ejidos, the, the rules, the institutional rules of ejidos only give uh, rights to participation in uh, in ejido assemblies to uh, the people that are title older of uh, of ejido land or or, or, or and uh, they tend to be male heads of households but because in many places these ejido date from for a long time uh, there there you have uh, important portions of the of the community that, are not title holders, very often children of the title holders, but also women. Women did not have the right to participate in the community discussion uh, because the title very often went to male. So the Zapatistas in, internally in the community that, that uh, decided to join them changed this and gave right to participate and to vote to everyone in the community, including uh, women. That's probably one of the big, big achievements of the Zapatista is to have also transformed, modified the gender relations in uh, peasant communities. Uh, this, this transformation of gender relations is, is uneven. You have places where traditional gender role have been maintained, but you have many places where this has completely changed. And you all know that many leadership positions are held by women within the organization. And several of the delegates of the representative that are coming in, in this uh, boat of, of, uh, uh, of the Zapatistas are, uh, as you know, women um, and transgender actually also. Uh, the Zapatista struggle is also, you know, a, 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 a radicalization or a radical democratization of society more broadly. And this is probably one of the aspects that is most well known about, about the Zapatista. So I won't speak to that. And probably we, we, uh, we will have time to speak about, about that in the, re in, in the period of question. Um, so why is this important for, uh, for mega projects? I think is it's important because the, pri the privatization of the right to, to land and more broadly, the pri privatization of collective goods uh, and of nature fundamentally is at the root of the neoliberal project. If you want, it's the master frame 
of the neoliberal project. And opposing the privatization of land and defending the right to land is fundamental in any opposition to mega projects, as probably the colleagues in the next in the in the other presentation are going to show. Um, it is about also opposing uh, the organization of society around profits and instead protecting the right to live in dignity for everyone. And this is what uh, the Zapatista struggle and many other indigenous and peasant struggle across the Americas and across the globe actually have been uh, about uh, in the past decades. So, um, I want now. To, I want to turn now to uh, uh, what this has meant politically in Mexico uh, for the Zapatista and for uh, neo anti neoliberal or anti capitalist struggles. When I was student at UNAM in the mid nineteen nineties and even until the mid two thousands, when I managed to live in Chiapas in these in indigenous communities, uh, in Zapatista communities. The Zapatista had a very strong support uh, among uh, Mexican civil society uh, and uh, social movements. But since the mid 2000s, uh, the, the Zapatista have had all kinds of difficulties in building coalitions, uh, uh, a coalition, an anti neoliberal, an anti capitalist movement around themselves. Uh, I think this is partly due to two things, maybe. One is that the majority of Mexicans still continue for good or for, or for bad to believe in the possibility of gradual change through elections. So many of them still vote uh, for left-wing or populist left-leaning uh, politician or political parties. Um, that's one maybe of the reason. And the other one, the second one is that the majority of the Mexican social organization, the social movement still continue to reproduce clientelistic patterns with politician, political parties and states. So many, many social movement have not taken the position that the Zapatista have of radical autonomy towards the state and towards political party. And that has hindered the possibility of broader alliances between uh, the, the Zapatistas and other civil or, uh, movement, other social movements in Mexico. Um, but even in the mid 90s or in the mid 2000s still people supported the Zapatista to a great extent because they were in solidarity with their struggle and there's possibly still millions of people that are in solidarity with their struggle, but also because they believe that uh, neoliberalism needs to be stopped, that we need to move to a different kind of society. And there's still millions of people that believe that. The Zapatista in turn, throughout this time, have supported all kinds of struggles against privatization. Uh, but their main supporters and their ma the main allies of the Zapatista have always been indigenous people and peasant communities who face mega projects and or groups that have faced state uh, repression. We can think of Atenco, we can think of Ayotzinapa, we can think of numerous cases of communities that have been dispossessed of their land in recent time. And I've reached out to the Zapatista or I've joined the Zapatista. Many of these movements have turned to the Zapatista because they have not found support elsewhere, especially not in political parties in Mexico. The big challenge for the Zapatista movement, I think, has constantly been about how to build a broader and larger alliance, uh, a larger movement, a national movement in, in Mexico and internationally also. And I think this is the importance of this trip to Europe. It's to continue to try to build bridges of, among organization and movements. They have thus, however, tried all kinds of initiative. And if you've been following the Zapatista, supporting the Zapatista for many years, you know which the, what these initiatives have been. Uh, La Escuelita, uh, the, the creation of, of El Frente much late, much earlier, uh, all kinds of initiative, uh, but they have not been successful. We have, we have to be honest. 
So I don't, I don't really have a clear answer to why that is, but I'm sure that many of you in uh, th this discussion today, in, in, in the room, the virtual room, have ideas about why that is and maybe what should be done in order to uh, see, the, see the development of this broader movement. And I hope we can have the discussion uh, in, in, in the period of, of discussion. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. These are the things I wanted to bring to the table today. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much for that, Dan. I think it's a great presentation to start uh, the conversation with. Uh, before I uh, introduce our next uh, speakers, I just want to say there were a few comments in the chat about troubles uh, with the sound being a bit too quiet. We think that this has to do more with the interpretation channel uh, than the sound itself. So for anyone that's having issues with the sound, just please check which channel and interpretation you are in. And maybe also uh, if you are in an interpretation channel, muting the original audio might help to make um, the sound a bit better. So uh, next up, uh, we have Emilio and Paloma uh, from Tejiendo Organización Revolucionaria which is an organization that strives to contribute to the struggle against capitalism and its consequences, against exploitation, dispossession, and repression. They struggle to establish a society without social classes where there is no exploitation or oppression of some over others, where no one gets rich at the expense of the labor of others, and where the opulence of a few is not the poverty of almost everyone else, where men and women can develop fully. That is to say, they are an anti-capitalist organization, and I give the floor to them. Uh, well, hello to everyone. Um, I'm going to be reading our presentation because I'm a little bit nervous, but I hope it, it goes well. Um, well, uh, I want to start by thanking you very much for the invitation. Uh, we want to start by agreeing everyone who listens to us. Um, the title of our presentation is Resisting Megaprojects, the case of the so-called Mayan train and the Interoceanic Corridor. We have divided our participation in two. First, I will talk a little about our organization and outline the mechanisms by which megaprojects are imposed. Then my partner will present the two concrete examples mentioned in the title. Next, please. Well, Emilia and I uh, are part of an organization that strives to contribute to the struggle against capitalism and its consequences, as Jimena was saying. Um, and when we are uh, an anti-capitalist organization, I'm not going to repeat that because I was going to read it, but what's the point, right? So next one. <laughs> um, well, to be congruent, with anti-capitalism, our political practice assumes the task of building alternatives from today. Social transformation begins now, from the spaces in which we develop. The struggle is for the destruction of the current system of domination, but it is also the construction of the new, of collectivities, tools, and spaces that from today allow us to advance. In particular, our organization works on five fronts communication, the university movement, the urban popular movement, syndicalism, and with indigenous people. Next one, please. Uh, to characterize the capitalist modus operandi, we can use the concepts repression, despoil, contempt, and exploitation. The four wheels of capitalism proposed by the Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional. Through these four wheels, it is possible to expose the logic of the economic political, social, and ideological mechanisms of cur current capitalism to exterminate the indigenous peoples and despoil them of their territories in order to offer their cultural wealth and natural resources to the global market as mere commodities. Next one. Becoming aware of the struggle and resistance of indigenous people against capitalism requires an understanding of the organizational process. <clears throat> Indigenous peoples have been fighting for five centuries and they have developed in the process uh, community tools that have enabled them to survive and keep resisting. Next one, please. 
indigenous people are an obstacle to capital, a rock in the shoe for capitalist accumulation. The current concentration, accumulation and reproduction of capital has dispossession as one of its fundamental aspects. In the case of Mexico, we can say that the so-called war against drug trafficking is a novel way in which the bourgeoisie imposes the concentration of capital through disposition. Or dispossession, sorry, I don't know how to say it. Also, the economic forms of concentration, next one, please. Also, the economic forms of concentration and accumulation of capital are not surpassed. The bourgeoisie has discovered that the extra economic forms accelerate the process of concentration and accumulation and make it more effective, that is, without resistance or with very diminished and easily repressible resistances. This concentration by disposition is also a strategy to overcome the economic crisis, to alter the conditions of inter bourgeois competition, since economic mechanisms are slower to concentrate capital than violent extra economic methods. For this reason, the bourgeoisie prefers the later, which is the current form of primitive accumulation. Next one. Therefore, today, um, the transcendence of the resistance and rebellion struggles of the indigenous people against the dispossession of their territories is given by the centrality acquired by the extra economic mechanisms of accumulation and their socio-ecological impacts on humanity. Next one. Neoliberal policies have gone through various different stages in Mexico. However, the later stage, uh, it has already been suggested, has further developed extra economic methods of accumulation that are even more inclined to violence so as to accelerate the accumulation of capital, giving free reign to the war on drugs, which is in truth a war against the people. The purpose behind this war against the people and particularly against indigenous people of Mexico is to terrorize entire regions so that economic reforms can be implemented with ease. Also similar, sorry, although similar strategies of expansion have constantly been used since the conquest, these new forms of control lead to the expulsion of the people from their lands and the reorganization of territories through repopulation thereby threatening the existence of Mexico as a sovereign nation. Next one. The way in which people have resisted and thought are diverse and complex, especially when they face the greater or less, to greater or less extent, the four wheels of capitalism, whose objective is to break the social fabric of indigenous communities, peoples and nations. In its current form, Capitalism cannot avoid the use of violence to dispossess communities of their land. As a result, indigenous people have had to implement various legal mechanisms to secure ownership of their territories, sometimes using colonial titles and other documents as evidence, and sometimes through collective struggle. Their main aim is to, recognize as, is to be recognized as people with rights, who are entitled to possess and govern collectively the territories that they have inherited for generations. So thank you, Paloma. So I'm gonna continue from here. So in this particular administration, the public debate has been especially complicated because uh, President AMLO seeks to legitimize itself as progressive, popular, and transformative. In this scenario, left organization and some right-winged -wing groups are all categorized as conservative, either leftist or rightist. Everything outside AMLO's tactics is then considered as wrong. And in contrast, its economic strategies and practices are aimed at maintaining the dynamics of dispossession, exploitation, and domination of the peoples. So uh, the discourse claims for a kind of regulated capitalism for the people, but the practices adapt to the international role uh, of accumulation designated for Mexico. That is as a zone for the circulation of commodities, extractivism, cheap labor supply, and low environmental criteria for the development of foreign capital. So in our organization, we think it's important to expose this kind of contradiction and also to join the people in struggle. In this sense, we have published uh, some magazines in solidarity with group such as the CNA, El Congreso Nacional Indígena, 
And through the Envi Environmental Analysis Group, guy in Spanish, we have collaborated with different scientists and organized groups to analyze mega projects in Mexico uh, with an ecological and a political perspective. So the objective of this kind of analysis is to add more tools uh, for the communities to resist. So in this case, uh, for today, I want to exemplify some examples of these kinds of mega projects and what are the ecological and social implication of this project. Uh, so I'm gonna start with the uh, Corredor Transismico and then with the so-called Mayan train. So the Isthmus of Tehuantepec Interoceanic Corridor is one of the flagship mega projects of AMLO's administration. It includes the restoration of the Isthmus Railway, a construction of the gas pipeline, industrial development areas, and energy projects. So uh, here's a map of how the government presents this project. You can see here that the program seeks for the well being of local people. And we can see in this map how the people seem to be happy, right? And there are a lot of people, and there are trees, there are cell phones too, that's good. And there are also cows and stuff like that. But what is it really, actually? This, what is this project really? So, in order to understand this project, we have to zoom out and look for the economic and the political drivers. So, here is a map from the 19th century where Anderson showed the main routes to transport the commodities from the US, USA Eastern industries to Europe or to Asian markets. And you can see here the importance of the corridor of Tehuantepec because it's the narrowest continental passage for this transportation. And considering also that it, this is one of the uh, unique zones where you don't have big mountain chains. So this route has always been really important for the transportation and circulation of commodities. This is also why the Canal of Panama is really important, right? Because all, uh, nowadays, almost all the transportation goes to that canal. So in this sense, the real purpose of this corridor is to make a special economic zone where taxes are lowered and where the products from, for example, from China can be brought to Mexico, assembled in this maquiladoras belt and sent to United States Eastern coast and or vice versa. So this is this kind of maquiladoras belt is also useful to stop Central Americans uh, to, uh, from migrating from Central America to the United States. So it's, it's really a political issue, right? because they can block the migrants because they all have to pass through the isthmus of Tehuantepec. So what are some of the, some example of the social and the ecological implication of this kind of project? The first one is that even if the project uh, says that it's creating a lot of jobs and it's looking for the people and everything, everything, they're all misery jobs. I mean, there are jobs in assembly and textile industry. And the life condition in those jobs are extremely rough. And if you don't accept it, you can get killed or disappeared. Also, for us, it's, in, for us, uh, it's important to show the ecological impact, the environmental impact, if you want, because it's also very deep. For example, this project also encompasses the construction of eolic parks. Eolic energy should not be a problem per se, but in this case, the low environmental standards do not consider, for example, the migratory flocks of birds. For example, here in blue, you have the parks that were built, the eolic parks that were built uh, before 2011. Then some researchers did a report of where, uh, where were the birds uh, moving through. And you can see the yellow, uh, the yellow arrows, arrows represent this flux of migratory birds. And then after this study, the more eolic parks were built clearly in the passage of those birds. And no novel study has been done since then. So this kind of standards make us think, makes us think that now the new administration will not consider this kind of stuff. And why is this important? So if you know, like birds have a lot of ecological function as such as pollination and the Isthmus passage includes two of the three principal migration routes. So the impact of this loss of connectivity will impact the whole continent. Right? So then the case of the so-called Mayan train. The Mayan train goes on five states. It's a train that goes on five states, on Chiapas, Tabaco, eh, Tabasco, Campeche, Yucatan, and Quintana Roo. 
and has uh, 19 uh, train station that has always been uh, that has also been called developmental poles that involve housing, hotels, and shopping malls. It also includes new highways and electric lines. So the official discourse is it claims that this is the first time an administration looks for the development of the Mexican Southeast. And they also say that it will promote a sustainable form of tourism and will trigger the economy of the region. So let's look again at, at the economic drivers. The first thing is that the train is not new. There have been, been a lot of projects to integrate the peninsula. And also, this is not the first time the development reaches uh, Yucatan Peninsula. We only have to remember, for example, the enormous Henneken industries promoted also by the Mexican government with the support of local and international elites. So for example, the, the horrible conditions of these industries and all the political stuff around it are well documented, for example, in John Kenneth Turner book, right? So the train really had at least four objectives. The first one is the fuel and commodities transportation. This makes sense if we see the whole map and you can see how the Mayan train integrates with the Corredor Transismico and also is connected with the main zone of oil extraction in the country. So this is uh, like the 70% of financiation of this train will be for fuel transportation. The second thing is massive tourism. They want to promote the Mayan Rivera model that is also called Mayan, but it has nothing to do with the Mayan people or the Cancun model. And the government says that this will spread richness through the region, but we say that will, this will and has always uh, uh, what it has always done is to spread poverty. It also looks for the integration of capitalistic agriculture. Here we can see some uh, zones of production of monoculture, uh, industrial monoculture, for example, sorghum, sugarcane, palm, and soy. And you can see how the Mayan train connects these zones to the pig farm zone in the northern Yucatan. In fact, uh, a lot of people that are financiating this train also have shares in this kind of industries. The last thing that is really important for them is the real estate development. So uh, what are the social and environmental consequences? Some example of the social and environmental consequences. The first thing is clearly the dispossession uh, of land and the displacement and contempt of people that is living there through financial or coercive mechanism. And this is important because we are living in a country where more than 340,000 people are displaced, had to leave their land, right? Again, the other thing is that the jobs that are promised are only in tourism or construction. And as Pedro Uc, one of the main defenders of Yucatan people said, is why can't we be other things? Why can't we be painters or dancers? Why do indigenous people always have to be what other people tell, tell us to be? So. In terms of the environment, also one important impact is the fragmentation of natural forests. These forests are needed for big mammals, for example, to move and connect different ecosystems from Mexico to Guatemala and Belize. This is not a problem due to the fact that those animals are cute. I mean, they are cute, but they are also the top predators that regulate traffic networks. So they disappear. if they disappear, they can destroy a lot of ecological function in those systems. Fragmentation, it's important to say, also leads to zoonotic-based pandemics, such as COVID-19. And I think most people understand this is important. The claim is also that the train will mainly pass through secondary vegetation. This is not true, but even if it was, it would also encompass big problems. In fact, even if some animals do not live in these secondary vegetation patches represented here in light green, they need them to travel from one patch to another. So if you construct a train, if you build a train here and cut this passage, uh, you cut the landscape connectivity. And this is highly problematic to the maintenance of biodiversity. And I also have to say that the environmental consequences are always related to social consequences. So to finish, uh, just to finish this presentation, uh, say that it, there are a lot of resistance against these projects. Every day people struggle for the land or their water. Every day the states and uh, economic elites kill them or disappear them. For example, in the case of Thomas Rojo that found dead 
that was found dead this week. Tomas Rojo was organizing the resistance, I guess, an aqueduct in the northern Mexico. And because that aqueduct deprivates their communities from their water. And this week he was found, and today it was confirmed that he was, it, it was him, the body that was found. So we think that the, um, in particular, we have been uh, lucky to work with, this, with these people because that's where most of our inspiration and information comes from. In particular, we have been lucky to work with organizations such as El Ismos Nuestro, El Congreso Nacional Indígena, La Asamblea Muchimbal, among others. And as the Zapatistas have encompassed much of this resistance, we think that their presence in Europe is a window for all the other struggles. And that's why we think this, this travel is so, so important. And also we wanted to thank this uh, organization that London Mexico Solidarity because they are creating these kind of spaces where different resistance uh, can be, it should be visibilized. So thank you. And this is the contact of the organization. I can leave it here for some minutes and then take it off. <laughs> thank you so much uh, to both Emilio and Paloma for that really, really great presentation. Um, maybe Claudia, you can copy their uh, information into the chat if you can help me with that so people can have it at hand. Uh, and uh, before we move uh, to the next uh, presentation, I just wanted to say that I've heard uh, words that uh, the crew from La Montaña have officially disembarked in Vigo, Spain. So of course, this is amazing news. Um, the Zapatista invasion to Europe is well officially underway, which is really, really exciting. And I'm sure everyone is super happy to hear this news. Um, and now we move to the third presentation with Alejandro de Coscorso, who is a lecturer in sociology at the University of Bath. His research focuses on questions of labor, infrastructure, urbanization, and power. In particularly, he has focused on the construction, maintenance, and repair of the hydraulic infrastructures in Mexico City and how they relate to the making and reproduction of state power, urban modernity, and its various forms of oppression and inequality. He has a PhD in sociology from London School of Economics, and it's also an alumni from the um, Escolita Zapatista. So I give the floor to Alejandro. Thank you, Jimena. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks to the uh, previous present presenters, great presentations. It's a bit of a tough act to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to be strictly talking about the neoliberal period, but I'm going to be talking a bit more about the history of mega projects around Mexico City. And in doing that, I want to highlight how some of the logics that we see today in the mega projects that, for example, uh, Paloma and Emilio were just describing might be rooted in previous ways of producing territory environment, and in doing so, uh, creating certain relations of power and certain economic relations um, in space. So I'm going to be focusing on that and hopefully we can make those connections later when we are having a more open discussion. Uh, actually, let me find myself before I go over because I know myself, uh, I can't talk for too long. So, um, I want to focus in particular on, this, on an area called Lerma. For those of you who are not from Mexico or Mexico City, Lerma is um, an area west of Mexico City, sort of kilo, 50 kilometers to the west. You know, Mexico City, it's surrounded by mountains on the forefront. It used to be a closed basin in the sense that all the water came down from the mountains, the volcanoes, and it filled this system of interconnected lakes that was desiccated uh, between the um, 16th century and the 20th century. Um, now it's no longer closed. There are some artificial exits from the basin. Anyway, Lerma is located 50 kilometers to the west in another basin. Uh, Lerma itself used to be a system of lagoons, marshes that are mostly gone. If you've been to Lerma, you can still see some of them, uh, but they're mostly gone. And I'm going to be talking a bit about the history of how they were desiccated. Thinking about this as a mega project, certainly, and one that is related to the constitution of the modern Mexican state, a bit like what Leandro was saying about this moment of independence and the 
process of, of dispossession that come with it, uh, but also perhaps pointing to more modern forms of uh, accumulation by dispossession, um, as a com compass from Thor were mentioning. So um, the Lerma, 50 kilometers west of Mexico City, had been long, long um, target of intervention for different elites. Uh, and I'm going to be focusing on two different moments. One of them in the uh, mid 19th century, in 1850, a local project developed by the governor of the state of Mexico, which is the state that surrounds Mexico City, to desiccate those lagoons, to transform them into small land uh, plots that could be uh, commercialized as private property. And then a 20th century project, mid 20th century project, that what it did was taking the water from Lerma, uh, not only from the lagoons, but from the underground, pump it to Mexico City to supply the city. Now that water still su supplies Mexico City today, it's not a huge quantity, it's only 12% only of Mexico City's water, but it's connected to other interbasin transfers that come from further afield that supply Mexico City with roughly 42% of its total water. So it's a big project that's connected to more modern interventions. Um, I want to start a bit with the, of, of, of um, and I'm going to be focusing, as I said before, or as Jimena said about me, I'm interested in questions of infrastructure. So I'm going to be talking a bit about that. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how these infrastructures articulate changes in the environment, how they mobilize political imaginaries, um, how they um, construct, as I said, relations of power. So in the 19th century, I'm following the work of uh, Mexican historian Gloria Camacho Pichardo, who has an excellent book called Agua y Liberalismo, Water and Liberalism, which is precisely about this history of the failed desiccation process of the Lerma. And you can see in that book, um, the kind of justifications that were being used to uh, desiccate these lagoons. The notion were that these waters were idle, they were polluting, they were doing nothing there, and they were sustaining these forms of living that were somehow pre-modern. And it has been shown that these lagoons supply, uh, sorry, sustained a series of uh, local economic and social relations of the indigenous populations of the area, the peasant populations of the area. And this was a target of intervention. And what the 19th century project led by the local liberal elite, Mariano Riva Palacio, the governor of that area, what they were trying to do and what they were saying was that by introducing private property, breaking up not only the communal land owning system that still survived from the colony, uh, and that again, as um, as um, we heard, was um, imposed again. Well, sorry, developed again with Ejido. Uh, they were trying to break up that, and what they were trying to do is create these small land-owning plots that were to be given, sold to the indigenous population in an effort of making them modern citizens. So what is interesting here for me is that this private property, that's part of this mega project of desiccating the lagoons was um, not, only an not only had an economic rationale, but it also had this kind of moralizing rationale. Through private property, these idle indigenous people who are backwards almost in this transition of thinking indigenous peoples as backwards biologically, and then the more kind of late 19th century, 20th century as a cultural difference saying, well, if we um, introduce private property, they will, will enable their transformation into modern citizens. Um, so this was, um, um, let's say, the, the supposed goal of the project. Certainly, it was a goal that could not be accomplished because the cost of transforming, uh, desiccating the, la the lagoons, transforming this territory was very steep. And it was supposed to be paid by these new landowners. So in reality, what it was, it was a land grab led by the local elites who are trying to enroll the local populations by telling them we are going to make you into a small landowner, you're going to be able to modernize your practices, you're going to be able to become part of this capitalist economy that we're trying to develop. It's very much an agricultural focus um, that again discursively was trying to push this idea of uh, private property as a modernizing, moralizing resource, but in reality was going to imply the uh, concentration of land in a small number of local landowners. In the end, this project didn't go forward. It collapsed 
towards the end of the 19th century for a series of reasons. You had uh, civil wars in Mexico, a lot of political strife locally. You had the high, very high fiscal cost of this that couldn't be paid by the local elites. And you also had a series of resistances by local populations that were using all kinds of different tools from um, not dissimilar to the ones we see today. So uh, going back to colonial times, using uh, titles of property, claiming common use over these lands. And again, this opposition delayed the project enough until it was abandoned. But certainly the Lerma remained in the imaginary of elites, this time not only in the state of Mexico, but in Mexico City. As Mexico City grew and grew, it was um, very clear very soon that just taking water from the underground, which still Mexico City does, 58% of the water comes from the underground, was not going to be enough to sustain the rate of urbanization and the projects for industrialization in the city. So immediately the site turned to Lerma. And it was in 1942, after many decades of planning, where the Lerma project was um, beginning its construction, it took nine years from 42 to 51. And in that period of time, what happened was that these lagoons, um, the water coming from them was um, channeled, sent through an aqueduct, a tunnel down to Mexico City. So Lerma is slightly higher up, so it just goes down. In theory, it's more efficient. In practice, probably it is as well. Uh, but in the end, it doesn't break the logic of expanding urbanization uh, by creating these networks of infrastructure that supply water to the city. And we get that same thing in water um, and drainage in Mexico City. Obviously, it had, this had very, very um, important implications for, for the Lerma area. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you go there today, this um, lacustrine system that used to be uh, what characterizes the zone, it's mostly gone. You still have a couple of remnants of the marshes, the both sides of the road that connects Lerma to Mexico City, but it has, it has completely been transformed. Uh, up until the 19th century, it used to be this area of lacustrine activity. Now it's this peri-urban area. What you have is um, a lot of industry and a lot of services related to industry. I spent a year there in Lerma with the workers that uh, give maintenance and repair the Mexico City water infrastructures. I was in Lerma and in Mexico City as well, and I could see all of this um, in, in life and in person. Um, and it's also very well documented in literature that the introduction of the Lerma um, system, what it did was destroy this lacustrine system and facilitated the conversion of previous peasants into um, industrial workers or an uh, industrial, a reserve of industrial workers, if not in um, true Marxist fashion, we can think about that. Um, but it, it did more than that. And I think this is also interesting to think about how these logics, which we could describe as internal colonialism, if we think about Pablo Gonzalez Casanova, for example, uh, it has another element which has to do with the formation of a Mexican citizen. And I mentioned before how with the 19th century project, what was attempted there was to transform these uh, rural populations, these indigenous populations into modern citizens through the moralizing device of private property. And what was happening in the 20th century was this idea of private property was, uh, was gone. It was about making these waters work for the nation. And the nation was basically um, similar to Mexico City because the progress of Mexico City was the progress of the Mexican post-revolutionary state. Um, and here the, the, the goal is to transform these populations into workers, yes, but workers that are identified as mestizo. And you can see this in a lot of the justifications of the project that were produced in the 40s, when partially what they are doing is giving something, these communities that are losing their water, and what they are giving back are uh, pipe water, some of them, not all of them, roads, electricity, and schools. The schools that were very much at the heart of the project of not only you know, education, but a very specific way of education centered in the kind of mythologies of the nation states. And if you see, I can't recall the numbers right now, but if you see the numbers of the num of uh, language indigenous languages spoken in the area, you can see a, third, a clear decrease. And we can think perhaps about this form of education as a way of mestizaje by the indigenization. 
it's not this idea of mixitude. It's not this idea of miscegenation that is kind of what the Mexican state promotes as the mythology of its racial citizen. It's something different. It's a process of this forgetting the language that is entangled with all of this question. It's something quite discussed at the moment. And being there in, in Lerma was very clear that this was something that the workers who, whose grandparents had once, most of them are from the area, their grandparents uh, were peasants. Some of them still grew, grew some uh, basic agriculture. They work in the industry and they had this kind of, I would say almost nostalgic view of looking at this. I remember, I always remember this conversation with a guy that operated a crane and we were just sitting there and he told me, you know, these pipes, they brought modernity to these towns. And modernity basically meant this process of progressive proletarianization, industrialization, and the turn to the urban. And you can see how there's a shift in the 19th century from this kind of agricultural logic to this 20th century urban logic. And here in Compass from Tor, I'm thinking that projects today have this global scale that might be related to this notion of planetary urbanization, certainly. But I'm also thinking, for example, of what Martin Arboleda calls this idea of the planetary mind and these global logistics chains. And it's for me interesting and also <laughs> complicated to see how these projects become and get articulated into ever more uh, expansive logics of capital accumulation. And I think that's important for us when we think about how this is being resisted. Now for the last seven minutes or so that I have, I want to talk a bit about what's going on today in that area of Lerma and connect it a bit to other resistances that are happening in relation to water supply in Mexico City. So as I said before, 42% of the water of Mexico City from, comes from outside the basin, 12% from the area of Lerma, 30% from an area called Kutsamala, which is even further to the west. And all of this is connected to Mexico City with large aqueducts um, that obviously need to be maintained and, uh, and repaired, et cetera, which is what I was looking at, but today I'm not focusing on that. Um, and it was in 2003 and 2004, uh, some of you might remember this, uh, there was a massive flood in an area uh, uh, close to um, Villa Victoria, which is one of the big dams that supplies Mexico City and around 300 hectares of land or that Mazawa people work in and work with were flooded. And this led to a series of protests by the Mazawa people, the Frente Mazawa, uh, which was one of the organizations that was there, uh, and the Ejército Zapatista de Mujeres Mazawas por la Defensa del Agua. So the Zapatista Army of Women in Defense of Water, Mazawa Women in Defense of Water. And it started as a protest against this flooding against Conagua, which is the National Water Commission, saying that they really hadn't planned this ahead, that they had taken all this water, they didn't even have water supply in their homes, it was regularly being flooded, there was not a plan of sustainable development in the area, and they started demanding this to Conagua. And there was an initial rejection, and what the Masawa people did on two occasions, one for a few hours, one for a bit longer than that, they blocked the access to a potabilization plant called Los Berros. And this put um, Mexico City in a, under huge pressure because water, all of this water needs to be potabilized before it reaches Mexico City. And it showed how this kind of choke point can be used by resistances to put a lot of pressure on the government who ended um, after a lot of repression and a lot of, it wasn't an easy process, let's say, but there was an, an option there of breaking this impasse. But of course the logics were not defeated by this moment of resistance. They are still there, the logics of appropriation um, and, and this huge transfer of resources from the hinterlands to Mexico City. You have other protests going on today in the area that have to do with the building of a new highway between Mexico City and Toluca in, in San Francisco, Xochicuautla. And again, they are for me showing this logic of uh, mega projects related to um, the city, uh, but also the changing nature of who, which justification is being used. And I think today we've heard some very interesting pointers of where this is going today. And I talked about the 19th century private property as this disciplining, moralizing, but also economically logical element. We talked about the 20th century and these notions of the nation state and social justice as justifying the appropriation of what did in Lerma. And I think an interesting question that the Compass from Tor, which is talking about now, is 
what is the logic being used today? How are these mega projects being developed? How is this question of internal colonialism or perhaps just colonialism being reproduced today? For me, as someone who's interested in the city, I wonder where the place of the city is, but perhaps a more interesting question for us today is where is the place of resistance and what does this mean for the strategies that the Zapatistas and others like us today um, are deploying against these projects? And I'm going to close on that because I really don't have any answers, but I hope I can hear a bit from you, just what you think. And hopefully what I did now made, made some sense in showing how these logics of the mega projects uh, and, and this internal colonial, colonial logics they kind of they, they put in practice are not something that we can um, just refer to related to neoliberalism, but preceded, exceeded, and become articulated in new ways. And I think it's interesting and important to query those new ways so we can actually face them in, in, a, in a theoretically informed, but also practically potent way. Uh, thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much for that, Alejandro, so much food for thought in that presentation. Uh, and I'm going to now uh, move on to our last, but certainly not least, uh, presenter, uh, Laura Dowley, who is currently working as a lawyer for environmental NGO Client Earth, where she supports forest communities in West and Central Africa to improve forest governance regimes and prevent deforestation. She previously worked on businesses and human rights in Mexico, where she accompanied communities negatively impacted by mining, energy, and infrastructure projects, and she advocated to improve the relevant legal frameworks. So I give the floor to Laura. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you to everyone for organizing this, Anthony and everyone else, and also to the, all the other presenters for their really interesting presentations. Um, so I'm going to talk this afternoon about my work with two organizations in Mexico, um, the two sister organizations. So the first is the uh, Proyecto Sobre Organización, Desarrollo, Educación e Investigación, o Poder, which is a uh, local NGO that accompanies communities that have been negatively impacted by mega projects. And then they have a sister organization called Empowered, which conducts strategic research um, looking into the kind of power relationships between companies, mega projects, and their stakeholders. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two specific cases um, I worked on, a mining project and an energy project, both of which violated the rights of local communities. Um, so just a bit of introduction to Poder and Empower's way of working. Um, the real logic behind all their work was that we really need to understand what the um, economic interests and power structures are behind these mega projects in order to be able to hold responsible actors accountable. Um, so a lot of the work we did was mapping who these actors are that have economic interests. Um, who are we talking about? There are all different kinds of actors that can have economic interests in these projects. Um, I guess probably the most important are the companies behind them. So often there'll be um, a company will have its name on the project, so the mining concession, um, or the environmental permit, but in fact, there's a whole complex web of companies behind that. So a whole series of kind of parent companies, different shareholders. And so it can actually be very difficult to work out which is the ultimate parent company who is controlling the project, who are the shareholders who are benefiting from a project. Um, also, there are big banks often behind these mega projects, so big financial institutions, um, or private banks that are either invested as uh, shareholders, so through equity finance, or provide debt finance to the project, so loans. Um, we often find private security firms who are providing securities for mines or energy com um, companies. Uh, also, local and national government can have financial interests in these local landowners. Um, and obviously, then all the companies in the, in the supply chains. Uh, of these projects, so upstream and downstream. Um, and there are, there are others, but these are probably some of the most important. Um, so for these two projects that I work on, I'm going to talk about how the mapping of those power structures uh, and economic interests behind the projects became really the kind of basis of communities' defence strategies. 
Uh, so the first project is a gold and silver mining project called the um, Ixaca project, which is owned by a Canadian mining company called Almaden Minerals, which is a huge company listed on the New York and Canadian stock exchanges. Um, the, the project is currently in the exploration stage. So uh, the, the company have been there for about 10 years, but they haven't yet moved to the exploitation stage. Um, it's located in the municipality of Ixtacamaxitlan, which is in the northern Sierra of uh, the state of Puebla, which is kind of central Me Mexico, uh, site to the east of Mexico City. Um, and Puebla is really rich in natural resources, so it has big forest cover and there's also lots of minerals. Um, and as a result, we find lots of mining concessions. And I think about 30% of the state of Puebla today is covered by mining concessions. And those are highly concentrated in the um, Northern Sierra. So what are the kind of rights violations that we see associated with this project? So for starters, there's really been no consultation. Um, in the area affected by this project, there are both indigenous and non-indigenous communities. Uh, and all communities have a right to self-determination, so the right to decide on their own form of economic, cultural, and social development, but communities really were never asked by the government or the company where they wanted this project. Um, then on top of this kind of general right, ind indigenous communities obviously have uh, an extra right to free prior and conformed consent, which is a right that arises from indigenous people's right to use, to own, to develop, and control their own lands, and which really seeks to until kind of structural um, racial discrimination uh, against indigenous peoples and to ensure that they can participate in the shaping of projects that are to be developed on their land. So in this case, what we found was that, that Almaden, the company, flat out denied the presence of indigenous communities in the area precisely so it didn't have to consult with them. Um, beyond this, uh, in this project, but in mining projects in general, uh, so they sap huge amounts of water from local rivers, leaving many communities without access to water supplies. This is already the case in this project. It will clearly only get worse once the project moves to the exploration stage. Um, it also releases toxic substances into the environment, uh, which cause health issues. They also destroy local economies, which are often very based on use of the environment. So things like sustainable management of forests, farming and ecotourism. Um, another big problem in this, in this area has been that the company and this project has really created big community conflicts. So between residents who perceive the promise of jobs and investment favorably, and then those who really fear environmental degradation and loss of access to their lands. And maybe just a quick point on the jobs and investment um, issue. Often what happens is there aren't really as many jobs created as mining companies promise and um, a lot of people are brought in from externally by the mining companies, particularly in the highest paid jobs. So they don't uh, normally create as many jobs as are promised. And in terms of the kind of investment and local development, these projects have finite um, kind of lifespan. So there might be a 10, 20, 30 year project. And once the mining company leaves, they then uh, don't reinvest. They obviously, after they've gone, there's no more investment in the area and they've destroyed the, the environment. So communities then can't go back to their, um, the, the kind of livelihoods that they had before the mine because they are um, dependent on an environment which has now been destroyed. Um, then also what we've seen in this area is serious violence against those community members that are defending their land. So uh, threats from company representatives from local law enforcement against people who oppose the project. There are examples for exam of, um, of, of these representatives killing local community members, animals or chickens, saying, you know, with the threat that, well, this is how we started and beware because the violence is gonna get worse um, if you continue uh, defending yourselves. And then uh, the company has been using drones to monitor community members uh, to find out where they live, again, as a kind of threat of, we know where you live, so watch out. Um, so how did we use that kind of power mapping of um, and mapping of economic interests uh, to bolster the community's uh, defense strategy? Well, it may be important to say that what, this wasn't the only strategy. We worked with a lot of other local NGOs, local communities, um, and together presented things like constitutional claims for uh, failure to consult with indigenous communities. And we 
um, question the legality environmental impact assessments. But beyond that, we use this power mapping to find other pressure points um, to yeah, really support their defense strategy. So our strategy here was really follow the money. So find out where the money was coming from for this project and how it could be cut off or used as a pressure point um, for the company to improve practices. So we did a lot of research into who the investors were in this project. And we basically found out that they were big investment management firms. Um, so we did quite a lot of kind of behind doors advocacy with these investors to try and get them in turn to pressure the company to improve their practices. And really we found that um, Kind of advocacy meetings with investors it was really important to translate rights violations into um the terms that they understood which is actually not very difficult because all these issues often can have a knock-on financial impact for the company but things like for example project delays related to community conflicts um uh legal cases which are going to cost them lots of money concessions being cancelled because they haven't consulted with indigenous communities. These are all arguments that investors will listen to. Um, and then on top of this, we pre presented complaints to financial regulators. So listed companies are required to publish information about their operations to their shareholders with a materiality threshold. So if an event or something happens that might have a material financial impact on the company, such as uh, a community conflict which is causing delays, lots of things I just men mentioned, um, not having the right environmental permit, they haven't um, doing the, been doing the proper consultation, all those can have a um, financial impact on a company and have to be reported to shareholders and Almaden haven't been doing this. So um, we presented complaints to the um, US and Canadian regulators, we didn't have much luck with the, with the US one, but the Canadian regulator then supported um, Armadon to publish the truth about what was going on. And then all um, battles on the way, the project hasn't been cancelled, it still isn't an exploration stage, but having Armadon have to present a report disclose, disclose that information to shareholders, that the price went down, investors lose confidence in the company, it can be more difficult for them to access debt finance and the project becomes a less, less viable. As I said, though, that case is uh, ongoing, the project hasn't been cancelled, we have won quite a few kind of battles along the way. Um, and then the other project is Code Wind Farm, owned by NXP Cité is the French state owned energy provider and is one of the biggest energy providers around the world. And they are trying to build a wind farm in Oaxaca on the Pacific coast of Mexico, which is located in an indigenous Zapotec community. Um, in terms of the kind of human rights violations we saw, well, many were very similar actually to the to the mining project, to the Ixtaca project. So the local community has accused uh, EDF since 2015 of failing to consult them and for totally disregarding their, their right to free prior and informed consent. Um, there have been a couple of one battles uh, over the last year or two where the local environmental agency has then agreed to conduct consultations, but these have really become a kind of box ticking exercise and don't comply with international standards, which say that communities um, have to receive information in a way that's culturally appropriate and is under understandable. And what we were finding was were consultations that lasted a day. There was a very complex um, presentation. Communities had no time to go away, digest the information, provide feedback. Um, and also really important to, importantly, a big part of free prior and inform, um, informed consent is that communities have to have the opportunity to say no and have that no be respected which hasn't been the case here um community members have also reported uh edf really trying to influence the consultations so there'd be company representatives waiting outside uh, the consultation hall trying to intimidate and bribe people going into the consultation saying if you support us we'll provide you with food for the week so really playing on the fact that these communities um are uh, kind of low income and and really kind of trying to sort of manipulate the poverty of these
communities. Um, then there have also been environmental impacts. So we always think of wind farms as kind of these great green energy projects, but it's not really the truth of it. So um, they, they obviously can harm birds, but they also can have like a really devastating impact on the natural habitats. Um, and this is particularly important in this particular indigenous community, which really relies heavily on the land, on the environment for their livelihood and for which um, the environment has a really strong cultural importance. Um, and then there's more of the same kind of community conflicts uh, and violence against people in the community who oppose the project. So um, what do we do in this case in terms of how do we use our power mapping research to, to try and um, support their defense strategy? Well, uh, there is a relatively new uh, French law, uh, a due diligence law, which uh, requires companies to um, respect human rights throughout their activities. And this includes through the subsidiaries through which they operate. Uh, so we did a lot of corporate research to find out what the corporate structure was behind this operating company, the Mexican subsidiary, which operated the wind farm uh, and how it linked to the parent company EDF in France. So in fact, the, the Mexican subsidiary and then the French parent company were six or seven times removed through six or seven different companies uh, held in different ways through different types of companies and shareholders. And this is really a tactic the companies often use to try and distance themselves from the operating company and say, we're not responsible because it's a different legal entity. Um, so in order for a case to be brought under this French due diligence law, we had to prove that EDF France, the parent company, had control over its Mexican subsidiary. So we uh, did a lot of um, uh, investigations to show, because a lot of this information, some of it's public, a lot of it is not public. Um, so you really need to, it was a lot of kind of phone calls, secret phone calls to company um, uh, executives and looking through corporate registers and things like that. So we had to prove that each company in the chain um, controlled the company below it. So that was either through owning the majority of shares or because the people sitting on the board were the same. So it may be a totally different legal entity, but in fact, the people making the decisions are, are the same people. Um, so we eventually kind of managed to prove that link and then representatives from the community alongside a local NGO called Prodesk and then Berlin-based NGO, the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights, filed a lawsuit uh, in Paris at the end of last year, urging EDF to respect the community's rights to suspend the project and to not go ahead with it until they were sure, which seems unlikely is going to happen, um, that the community consent to it. Uh, that was presented yet at the end of last year. We don't have a, a decision that yet it's still ongoing. Um, so I think uh, the two kind of most important things that I'd like you to take away from this afternoon is that uh, both indigenous and non-indigenous communities have a right to self-determination. And a, a crucial part of that right is having the right to decide on their own economic and development models. Uh, and the second thing is that we really need to be able to understand the power structures and economic interests behind these mega projects in order for communities to effectively be able to defend themselves against them and defend themselves um, in the face of violent violations of their right to self-determination. Thank you. Nosotras las mujeres, este día nos sentimos muy contenta y tranquila y un corazón fuerte por ver los muchos de diferentes estaturas, colores como el maíz, que hay color amarillo, negro, blanco, pero todos somos una sola humanidad. Nació un caracol, un caracol, un caracol de guerra, en plena selva madre del sur, con luz de luna llena. Emprende el viaje al amanecer, 
del caracol sobre un rayo del día no lo detiene la noche ya ves pasa y nadie lo mira una injusticia lo hará padecer grita un silencio acuesta solo ver su mejor arma es un mar sobre su espalda donde aguarda con valentía para iniciar al alma. Y el caracol, el caracol, paso y casa que vienen, serio mirando al frente, va hacia el futuro, quien lo detiene, trae la muerte un paso atrás de él, muere callado y se oye puesto en pie su mejor arma. De su mar es lo que queda, trae oído atento, sabrás, sigue cantando guerra. Ayer nació un caracol, un caracol, un caracol, un caracol de guerra.